Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Matinia. I've been investigating basic mechanisms of VHL disease for a few years now. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about my research today, and I appreciate your taking the time out of your day to listen. As patients, you're the ones that educate us about the disease. You've possibly participated in clinical studies or trials, and you've likely seen therapeutic advances in your lifetime. What you might not have seen are the dozens to hundreds of small breakthroughs in research that eventually come together to make big advances that might affect your daily lives. These small breakthroughs are the results of efforts across many labs, many approaches, and many decades. A very brief synopsis of major research advances starts with the symptoms of VHL first being identified well over 100 years ago, but it took almost 40 years for VHL to be recognized as a singular disease. The symptoms that led to this were retinal hemangioblastomas, and they are often still the first symptom that leads to a diagnosis today. It took many studies over another 40 years when, by the 1980s, researchers found the location on our chromosomes that predict this disease. The advent of molecular biology opened up entirely new avenues and within less than 10 years, the VHL gene was found and researchers were starting to understand how mutations lead to the disease. Over the next decade, researchers identified an oxygen sensing system that goes wrong in VHL disease, in part through the use of animal models, including a mouse line genetically engineered so that the VHL gene could be rendered inactive in any tissue of choice. Therapeutics were being developed to target this oxygen sensing pathway. In the retina, however, these drugs were not effective against hemangioblastomas. By the mid-2010s, another drug came into the picture. It was around this time that I attended my first VHL conference in 2018. That night, I went down to the hotel lobby to get some dinner, and I overheard two people talking about this HIF2 inhibitor and how it had great potential. To me, that was a historical moment. Those people were Dr. Iliopoulos and a young man from Peloton Therapeutics, a small startup company that came out of research at UT Southwestern in Dallas. The company was later acquired by Merck that had the size, money, and infrastructure to bring this new drug, Belzutifan, to trial and markets. So what about my research? I'm in ophthalmological research, and Dr. Michael Gorin, who's treated VHL patients for retinal hemangioblastomas for decades, came to me one day and said, there's this disease with no treatment other than laser ablation, and that's not good enough. I've got an idea. The idea was to make a good animal model of retinal hemangioblastomas. Now, you'll remember a moment ago, I told you a mouse line was had been made almost 15 years earlier. However, there was still no effective mouse model for retinal hemangioblastomas. So we got to work looking at the literature and saw that researchers had targeted specific cell types in the retina that they thought would be the tumor-forming cells, but all of this was to no avail. These were smart people, so we knew we had to recruit a collaborator that was even smarter. We realized that nature and biology was much smarter than any of us. It had already figured out which cells become the tumor. So we decided to inactivate the VHL gene without any bias and we used a strategy that non-selectively targets many different cell types in the retina, and we let nature take its course. Once we did this, we waited for hemangioblastomas to form, and they did. This was the model I presented back in 2018. As I mentioned, this was a historical moment in my eyes where Belzutifan was just starting to go mainstream. Our mouse had large hemangioblastomas that very closely resembled the human pathology, but it also had a critical problem. It was not highly efficient at forming hemangioblastomas. We had success, but not good enough to go forward productively. So we went back to the drawing board. We'd used a specific virus to deliver the means to inactivate VHL, and it clearly targeted the right cell types, but not with a high frequency. It's known that different versions or serotypes of the virus target slightly different cell types. So we tried a number of different viral serotypes and we got lucky. We went from a model with only 30% of mice getting hemangioblastomas and no way to diagnose it except by tissue pathology to a model with 86% of mice getting hemangioblastomas and a non-invasive 
in vivo tests that is diagnostic for them. This mouse model will allow us to now seek to identify which cells initiate hemangioblastoma formation. We'll use deductive reasoning to narrow down the tumor initiating cells in mice that do get hemangioblastomas from those that don't. Our hope is that with a specific cell type to target, we can start thinking about additional therapeutics. I'd like to spend the last minute on this. During our studies, the effectiveness of belzutifan was being shown in clinical trials and then in clinic. Did we even need to continue? Had this problem been solved so that patients could live better, healthier, and happier lives using this drug? So while belzutifan works really well, it may not be the complete answer. Even though they shrink or disappear, some tumors persist. The drug is generally very well tolerated by patients, but we don't know if this will be the case over decades of use. So we will follow through in hopes of finding additional potential targets for combination therapy that may allow better outcomes and fewer side effects. In research, the effort, time, overcoming obstacles, and persevering are all really important. Sometimes a small step can be a struggle, but when we overcome it, it is a step forward. And with enough step forwards, we'll walk miles. <laughs>